Hello everybody! Welcome to Techniques for Maintainable Quarkus Applications. I'm Anna. I'm very happy to be here today with you, a Java champion and working as an architect in my day-to-day -day job. I have started installing Java at core, but I also like to entangle the mysteries of Kubernetes. And I have certified the second passion of mine uh, with OpenShift and Linux Foundation certifications. I'm sharing my experience and my experiments uh, within different events, but also within the Press Software Craftsmanship community, which I co-founded together with my dear friend Victor Renta. In today's talk, the accent, of course, is going to be on uh, writing maintainable code with Quarkus and techniques around that. Uh, but um, when we're thinking about maintainability, well, maybe in the slide is depicted the system lifecycle cost point of view, but maintainability from the uh, code maker point of view, from our point of view, is actually uh, defined as the easiness with which we can um, change a piece of software, meaning the easiness with which we can correct faults for a piece of software or improve the performance of that piece of software. In a nutshell, the easiness with which a software system can be adapted to a changed environment. And there are some metrics and, of course, automated tools that can assess how maintainable is a piece of code or a piece of software. But in the end, it all starts with some good techniques. Speaking about maintainable software, uh, microservices architecture is one of the widely adopted architecture patterns nowadays and is also ticking the maintainability box. So uh, microservices is very much loved also from a maintainability point of view, um, maintainability being one of the NFRs that many architects are looking into and when adopting microservices. And the features that make microservices so, uh, so loved also from a maintainability point of view is because, well, we need to deploy uh, fixes or you need to deploy uh, um, things that improve the performance of a microservice, the microservices can be deployed independently and this is very important. Secondly, if there is a fault with the microservice, there is a bug, there is a problem um, and um, that microservice is not behaving as expected, that failure is not going to affect the rest of the microservices from the ecosystem. So the, uh, the microservices actually um, support fault isolation. Since we talked about uh, you know, depend in deployment independency, when you are deploying microservices, actually um, you are most of the time uh, having zero downtime for those microservices. So microservice architecture is also important from availability point of view. Your users will feel the improvements without actually feeling your application uh, going down uh, or a certain part of your application going down. And zero downtime can be achieved uh, by using containers and containers or container orchestrators such as Kubernetes um, and employ uh, some uh, deployment techniques. And well, of course, uh, microservices are very loved because they also allow granular scaling. What this means is that uh, when certain um, um, endpoints or certain parts of your application distributed system receive more pressure from the workload of the, from the amount of users that are using uh, that particular functionality from your app, you don't need to scale your entire distributed system so that you can offer a good, uh, a good service. You can just scale these uh, endpoints that are not that, um, that need a little bit more power, right? And we talked about microservices, but with what were we going to build them? And one of the options to build microservices nowadays is Quarkus. Of course, you can make microservices from scratch and you can choose any, uh, any programming language, uh, almost any programming language that you can like to make microservices. But uh, most of the time when you're thinking of making a distributed system, you're also thinking to make it with speed. And Quarkus is supporting this idea of making uh, distributed systems with speed because, well, it's a Kubernetes native Java framework um, that is um, tailored um, to work with GraalVM and hot OpenJDK Hotspot. And it has some cool features that help you to speed your development uh, practices. First of all, that helps you to speed your development is the development uh, developer experience because well, Carcass has unified configuration, but it also has live reload. So this means that when you're in your IDE, you're making changes to your app, you will probably see those instantaneously um, done a on your server because uh, you don't have to restart your Quarkus app so that you can see what you've done. Secondly, if you're working with relational databases and probably you've worked in the past with JPA or in Hibernate, you have Panache that abstracts for you some work uh, when it comes to dealing with databases. And this is another cool feature. 
And well, probably some of you are thinking of Quark because that is too new um, that you have had Spring experience or Spring Boot experience like myself. And I, I've been there. I've been wondering like how would I do certain certain tasks or certain things with Quark as having so much Spring background and was a little bit in doubt and how and but seeing that Quarkus has Spring API compatibility has put me at ease um, and well, I really like that besides the Spring API compatibility, Quarkus has also early detection of dependency injection errors at compile time instead of runtime. And since you saw that it has Spring API compatibility, probably you've already guessed that um, Quarkus has a lot of integration capabilities for um, caching, for um, service-to-service -service communication such as GraphQL or gRPC, for Leakybase, uh, and many, many more. In the app that we're going to look into today, it's called Personalized Facts. So Personalized Facts microservice um, is exposing mainly an API for consumption or orchestration together with the uh, rest of uh, microservices in the ecosystem or maybe for consumption by the end users directly. Uh, but Personalized Facts is not on its own. Like some of the microservices, they sometimes, um, sometimes you see that you need to consume APIs that are not under your jurisdiction. When you're evolving your distributed platform from legacy to something new, you also still have to stick together with some endpoints that are not under your jurisdiction, under your control. And in this case, I simulated this with the Cat Facts API, which I'm consuming in my personalized facts and um, after consuming my cat facts API and personalized facts, I'm making some changes over it and I'm exposing to my end user those, uh, those changed informations. And not only this, like in the real life, sometimes when you're consuming information from, an, from another endpoint, you probably um, need to do some more, um, more, some more changes around it. So it'd be better if you would persist them somewhere, probably in a database so that you can retrieve it much more faster in the future for your end users and not all the time go and back and forth through the API. Those being said, let's code. If you're wondering how I have generated my microservice, well, that's easy. I have went to code.quarkus.io. I select, I've just created my um, name of the, of the group here, name of my artifact, which is personalized facts. I'm using Maven as my build tool. And um, I have selected a series of uh, dependent of extensions here. So first of all, I selected REST Easy Jackson because uh, when constructing an API, for me, it's easier to work with REST first and afterward evolve it to something else. So uh, that's how I went with it. Then afterwards, because I actually wanted to expose my, uh, my um, microservice to have a GraphQL API, I have selected the uh, smaller I GraphQL extension and well, I will evolve this one to this one um, pretty easy and I'm gonna show you how I'm doing it. Then uh, I'm consuming any, another endpoint. So I need the REST client with the REST client JSON serialization because I need to you know, consume some data and uh, furthermore serialize it. Um, then I am storing some data in my database and I need the driver, the Postgres SQL driver and I'm using Ponachi on top of, of that so that I can interact easier with my database and with Hibernate. I'm using Micrometer Metrics not only just, uh, well, I'm using Micrometer Metrics to, um, in my test because I want to emphasize a little bit how you can use Micrometer in the tests. And well, I'm using also um, the cache part because uh, sometimes you realize that in your app it's easier if you cache a few things and serve those things from cache to your end users instead of going to your um, to your um, uh, you know to your database or to your uh, or to the um, third-party service for consumption forever and, and ever again. And now let's go to the ID. Now you see here that I already have some code. And uh, we're going to look at the application of properties where we're going to have our unified configuration. We also have the personalized uh, facts resource, the resource that we're actually exposing to and we're, that is giving the uh, other third parties the API produced by personalized facts and has quite a few methods. And you see here the fact service. Now, fact service is actually the REST client that is consuming the cat facts API. And you see it's a nice interface, it's very clean, it has also fallback, like in case of my API is not responding, I can, you know, serve some information to my end user or some default information to my end users. Um, and uh, it's pretty, pretty straightforward to work with it. Now, 
going back to the application properties uh, in my local let's say i can work with my postgres sql database which is local is cool is really nice um but i need to also think uh, as a developer like how i'm going to work with this in production now i'm going to use the lovely technique of copy pasting and um, because I want to separate the two run modes, uh, I, wanna, I will prefix this one with percentage dev and uh, point here. And I'm just going to make this one as a dev configuration so that I am not, you know, instructing production to use local host and other type of, uh, of changes. And I'm pretty fine with this, uh, with this configuration for the moment. Now let's go to prod. Prod, I need to prefix it with another uh, prefix. So I'm going to say percentage prod and uh, just copy paste this value here. Cool. And in prod at initial capacity, I'm going to set it higher to 100, let's say. So the kind I can keep it to Postgres, but most probably in production, I will not know the username. So I will replace this one with um, Postgres user variable that I expect to be available for, to me from the environment, from CI/CD, from uh, Kubernetes, from my Docker file. So I expect it to come from the environment and I'm just putting it like this. And I'm just putting here another uh, variable like Postgres password. And most probably in production, I will not know also the URL where my database is. And I'm just going to keep it like Postgres URL for the moment. Given that it's production, most probably I cannot drop and create every time production. And this is going to be on none. And I also will not like to log the SQL because who knows what I'm logging and it might be dangerous to be logged. Now, one other thing that I like to do is actually to define this variable the log level and tailor the log level. Now there is a general log level here um, that I can set on info, for example. And this is related to Quarkus itself around my app, right? But I can tailor even more and add the, um, actually the log level for my app and, uh, you know, tailor it and give a value for it as well say app log level and I can actually make many more categories per package here uh, and I'm going to give the value the default value of debug because maybe these can be forgotten in my in my exterior configuration but I want to have some default values to it now my import.sql probably is not going to be the same between uh, prod and, and dev um, and I'm just going to uh, so add the suffix of minus prod here for production and minus dev here for dev and um, that's um, it for the moment for my configuration. Now let's go a bit with the test configuration um, because I also want to do some tests and sometimes to do some integration tests. And I'm going to use an in-memory database. And uh, let me just copy paste this one and add here test and add 10, for example. Um, so this is going to have import test and this is going to use in memory. And actually, if I'm thinking better, I just want to speed up the things for me. I don't think I'm going to use my local Postgres SQL. I'm just going to go with uh, my um, in memory database for dev as well. So this is it for the moment. Now I need to have only one import.sql. So I need to copy this one and make many more. So copy paste import minus prod cancel and actually paste import minus test. Now, um, if I would have worked in my um, dev with um, uh, the Postgres SQL database, uh, you would have seen me that uh, in my dev, I would have used um, something uh, for my dev for my Postgres SQL. So when you're having, um, you know, different types of databases, it's unlikely to happen in real life, but I'm just speaking out loud here. And for example, uh, my personalized fact table, um, it has the personalized fact model, which is using as a primary key um, an ID, which is a new ID and uses a generated value of UID. Now the UID generated value differs across the 
uh, database providers. So for Postgres is like this, right? This is the syntax for making it um, default UID. But how about for, you know, uh, for in-memory database? So in-memory, it looks like this, random UID. So you need to be cautious, in, and this is why it's good to separate your, um, in, your import.sql per profile. And maybe in production, for example, if you want to make sure that all the time you have the database available there, since you put it on none, you can also put the create table, for example, in your import minus prod. That's about it for the moment. Um, let's go to the personalized facts resource and look at another aspect that's important for us as developers. So probably um, you will notice that sometimes you need to decide how you're going to expose an API. Are you going to expose it synchronously? Are you going to expose it asynchronously? And even if you're consuming an API, you have the same challenges. It doesn't mean that if you're consuming something synchronously or synchronously, you cannot improve around that. So one thing that you can do is actually to see how well uh, the two endpoints, synchronous versus asynchronous, behave, even though they're consuming the same type of service, is actually use an, a, a test. So what I've done, I went to my personalized fact resource test and added the compare response times method. Now, obviously, sync time is bigger than a sync time according to this code but we need to do it like proper developers. So what I'm going to use for this one is actually a timer that is going to register the duration of the synchronous requests. Um, and I'm just going to make some synchronous requests uh, to, my, uh, to my API. Um, so factor this and align this. And then I'm going to use this is the timer sync and it records and records the sync time and then I'm going to use the asynchronous timer uh, which is going to you know measure the asynchronous requests and how are those behaving so I'm just um, you know aligning these two and I'm just removing this so that they're doing the same thing let's check how the response times are behaving. And now let's run the tests, run the compare this response times. And I'm expecting that my asynchronous time will be bigger than the asynchronous one. Cool. Now, um, I think I have something to be indexed by the ID. So while the test is being running, um, is running here, um, I will be uh, looking to another aspect of the app. So, for example, let's just say that if I'm going to my facts service and I'm realizing that, well, um, the get fact by ID, uh, if the facts do not change and I know the fact ID, maybe sometimes I can cache the fact by ID. So what I can do, I can say at cache um, result and use the cache here and um, give a cache name for this one and say like animal um, fact async sorry okay let me check if uh, okay so it's fine okay uh, and I can cache this one by um, cache key fact ID. Cool. But when I'm working with caches, well, I need to also define a few more things, like how big is going to be my cache and how, when it should expire. So what I can do, I can define these values here and I can say animal fact async. Um, and I'm defining the initial capacity of 10 with uh, maximum size of my cache is 20 and expires after 60 seconds, right? So that's one of way of working with cache. But I also need to assess, uh, well, how well is that cache behaving integrated with my personalized facts resources. So all I can do, I can make another test. I'm going to the personalized facts resources and I should measure my cache. And for that one, I'm using a gauge. So another micrometer um, component and my gauge, I am, sorry, 
um, it's going to measure my um, you know my cache of course it's not location by name is oh, sorry about this come on uh, it's going to be animal fact async and uh, I am measuring the cache size. Uh, of course, I need to make some, um, you know, some requests so that I can see how my cache is behaving. And um, I want to see, and then this is going to execute five times some requests in my cache. And then I am going to see how my cache has behaved by measuring the size of my cache. So um, let's see what's the size of my cache. Now the size of my cache is going to be uh, like um, one, even though this one repeats, two, three. And even though it's repeating, I mean the size of my cache, it should be three here. So this is my assertion for you know things that are gonna be uh, measured uh, by cache. So that's, uh, that's how I'm gonna measure them and see how that, how that is going to, to behave and that's my expectation for it. Um, this is how we can measure caches with gauges. Now, uh, moving a little bit forward, um, if you want to like see how your endpoints are behaving and how well are they responding, you can also when you're working with consumption of services, you can control and see how the response of your endpoints is going on by using uh, distribution summaries. So by you know just instantiating a simple method, um, it's a simple matter, and you know creating a distribution summary, you can see how well are behaving your endpoints, and you can see how the how the distribution of requests are, are is happening, and and record them and and see them and how they are happening and, and going on and you can you have some example here on how to work with a simple way of with histograms and with distribution summaries and another example with how to work with percentiles now uh, what I want to do I actually want to measure the cached factor sync as well and uh, see how that one is behaving and if it's the uh, test is successful as well Another thing that I want to bring to your attention is sometimes when you're working with caches and when you're initializing an app, you realize that you can, you know, um, add some uh, some boost to your app when it's beginning, right? So what you do, um, you can, you know, instantiate your database or initialize your database not just with import.sql. Maybe you are ingesting some data from somewhere else and you need to store it. So what you can do, you can add this annotation called a startup, and you can make um, you know an initializer for your for your app. But you know initializers uh, are good for the real life app, but if you're working with a test profile, they're not really nice, you know, because it will take some time. All your tests all the time are gonna uh, take into account the initializer. You can see this one. This is what I in particular let the initializer to happen because I wanted for you to see how difficult the tests are you know are working because they're taking into account all the um, all, all the Quarkus context and um, the less build profile what it does is actually if I'm enabling this I'm telling to Quarkus like hey skip this one when you are you know ramping up the Quarkus, um, Quarkus app and when you're in uh, in test but do it for the rest of the profiles because well um, those should benefit from this from this initializer so pay attention and use this this trick really really cool um, and also let me start my Quarkus app um, really quick because um, I want to show you something as well so I'm going to start my app and see how the test has behaved also while the app is starting. It shouldn't take long anyway. Oh, all the tests passed, so we're measuring the cache perfectly. Um, and now the, that the app is starting, we can see some things going on in, in, the, in the real life as well. And of course, you can see that the build profile is going to be executed and the app is going to be initialized.
cool. Cool. So my app has started. Let me go to my browser, localhost 8080. I'm going to slash Q because I want to see the endpoints. Um, and I can see here I have the endpoints and some information. I have the dev UI if I want to see my uh, extensions and what I'm using, the cache and also the configuration and I have the connect config editor here as well. But um, probably yourselves like myself are used to seeing the REST resources in a different type of layout. So um, I've forgotten the Swagger extension. So I'm, I'm saying here Swagger and I just go here and copy the command and add this to Maven. Now I'm going to my IDE um, in the terminal and just add the command and this is going to add the Quarkus extension for the uh, for the small right open API with uh, Swagger included uh, to my POM file and well you can see here there is no um, no problem with the version so Quarkus is taking care about mixing the versions perfectly for me through its extensions um, and not only this uh, now that um, you know things um, have been updated in the POM, I need to rerun my app so that it takes into account um, the new dependency. So this is when what's happening when you are adding a dependency, sometimes it stops, uh, but no problem, it will start in a moment. Okay. Sorry, it's building and it takes some time for my ID to do that. Um, I was really surprised to see that it's not uh, starting, but um, IntelliJ is doing its job. Um, and of course, as I promised to you, I promised that uh, we're going to evolve also the personalized facts resource to a GraphQL API and that's very easy. You just go here and add, add GraphQL. Sorry. I think it's like this, GraphQL API. And it's very easy also to uh, transform the endpoints, like for example, um, add this one uh, to query and say here all facts by type um, and add another query for this one. Let's say um, at query all facts by type async. Um, so it's pretty straightforward to, to work this. And also if I'm gonna go to the opponent XML, um, I can generate you know the um, uh, the um, schema, the GraphQL schema with the a small like GraphQL Maven plugin. Uh, with generate schema that's pretty standard, pretty easy to do uh, and to see the generated schema as well. Um, so this is how you're evolving it to a, to a GraphQL API and, and seeing it uh, go and gone. Now let's take and have a little patience with it because I have done changes uh, while indexing and all, and all the other good stuff. So I kind of put it a little bit under pressure, the, my Quarkus app. Um, but I'm expecting it to start any moment now. So, yeah, this is what is happening when you're trying to do too many things at once. Um, and also recording. Um, but, um, just be a little bit more patient uh, and it's going to be working in an instant. Ta -ta -ta. Hmm. Yep, done. Woohoo, started. Now, I'm going to reset or restart this one here. Um, so, first of all, Swagger UI. Open it in a new window. Now we have Swagger here. Yay, cool. So you can see the REST resources, but I said to you that I also want to see the GraphQL part. So I also have GraphQL UI. 
and there is the GraphQL UI where I can see the schemas and for example I can see the all facts by type, I can see the queries and I can see all facts by type of sync, all facts by type, the ones that I generated earlier with my schema and things are working as expected. So and you can see here that when I query the all facts by type I get the information from here. Well, hope you like the demo. Uh, some takeaways from you. Well, refine the log details per application profile per package need. And as you saw me, use variables and default values for those variables in your application or properties. Validate the performance of your endpoint implementation by using timer uh, to compare different duration of requests. But also use, uh, when you're using caches, use GOSH to see uh, in your integration caches that the capacity of your cache is actually the one that you were expecting it and your cache is behaving as expected, especially when you're consuming services from other APIs. So pay attention to that. It's very important. Um, thirdly, well, um, you can control your endpoint response time by using distribution summary and histograms. So you can inspect how your endpoints are behaving um, in response time with distribution summary and histograms and you don't just have to annotate those endpoints and see how they are behaving uh, well in uh, Grafana, for example. You can also do that in your um, integration tests as well. Um, thirdly, well, um, annotate with a less build profile if you want to inhibit some long running operations when you're using your uh, tests. So if you don't need an insurgent profile to have some things long running, um, well, just use the NLS build profile. Sometimes um, when you're doing smoke tests, the uh, build profile, if build profile is very, very useful. Um, it's another annotation that you can look into. Um, so be cautious and use the annotations to help you into bringing more speed for your Quarkus app. And last but not least, generate the GraphQL schema for each microservice and use schema's teaching for further client consumption. Thank you for listening to me. It was a pleasure to talk with you. I'm looking forward to your questions. And you can find the code at my GitHub with the personalized facts. And I hope you enjoyed the session. Um, also take a look into the code because there are a few more things that I didn't demo today there, but maybe they're helpful for you when you're building your own Quarkus applications. Also, these are the guides that you can look into. And thank you. See ya.